Today, I'll be talking about a new RL algorithm we've been developing at OpenAI called Basic Policy Gradient. Basic Policy Gradient, or PBG, is a reinforcement learning framework which modifies traditional on-policy actor-critic methods by separating policy and value function training into distinct phases. In actor-critic methods, we have two key quantities which are driving learning, the policy and the value function. In most algorithms, you have, broadly speaking, two choices for how to represent the policy and the value function. The first option is to use a single shared network with separate policy and value function heads. The second option is to use disjoint networks. Each choice offers certain advantages. Using separate networks avoids interference between the two objectives, while using a single shared network allows useful features to be shared. Ideally, we'd like to get the best of both worlds. PBG is able to achieve this by splitting optimization into two phases, one that advances training and one which distills features. We'll talk more about this as soon as we dive into the algorithmic details. Now, it might seem like the choice to use separate networks or a shared network is a relatively minor implementation decision. However, in practice, this simple decision often has really big consequences. Here we show a comparison between two implementations of PPO trained on the 16 procedurally generated environments from ProcGen Benchmark. Procedural generation makes these environments highly diverse, and they're ideal for evaluating RL agents. We'll be using ProcGen Benchmark for evaluation throughout this work. So in blue, we show the uh, performance of our baseline agent, which is trained using a single shared network for policy and value function. And in orange, we show an agent trained with disjoint policy and value function networks. As we can see, the, um, this agent in orange performs much worse. Because the policy and the value function are unable to share features, sample efficiency takes a big hit. So what, if anything, is the downside of sharing features? There are two main downsides. First, the policy and the value function must be trained on the same data. This means we have to train both the policy and the value function with the same level of sample reuse. However, there's no reason to think that this is going to be optimal. It could be the one or the other will benefit from a higher level of sample reuse. In that case, training both of the same sample reuse will be suboptimal. Second, when we use shared networks, we know there will be some amount of interference between the policy and the value function objectives. In PPO, we control the relative weight of each objective with a well-chosen hyperparameter, but ideally, we wouldn't have to make this trade-off. We like to train the policy purely from the policy gradient. With PBG, we can address both of these concerns. We can reduce interference between policy and value function optimization, and we can more aggressively train the value function with a higher level of sample reuse. I'll now explain how we do this. I'll start by giving a high-level overview of the algorithm, and then we'll dive into some more detailed pseudocode. In PBG, training proceeds in two alternating phases, the policy phase followed by the auxiliary phase. The policy phase is simply a standard RL training loop. We perform rollouts in the environment to collect a certain amount of data, and then we update the policy using any on-policy algorithm. In our case, we use proximal policy optimization, or PPO, that we expect other algorithms would also work well. Throughout the policy phase, we store states and value function targets in replay buffer to be used during the auxiliary phase. During the auxiliary phase, we distill features from the value network into the policy network. Although this distillation does nothing to improve the current policy, it should improve training in future policy phases. A policy network with more useful features will learn faster in future policy phases. Compared to PPO, the novel contribution of PPG is the inclusion of these periodic auxiliary phases. Here's a diagram of the network architecture we use in PPG. We train separate policy and value function networks. The color coding shows how gradients flow during each phase. During the policy phase, there's no interference between the policy and value function gradients, since each network is optimizing its own objective. That can be seen by looking at the orange lines. During the auxiliary phase, we distill the most up-to-date value function information into the policy network, while also preserving the current policy as best as possible. In practice, this distillation will ever so slightly degrade the current policy, but the amount of degradation is generally minor. We also continue training the true value function during the auxiliary phase, though we find that the effect of doing so is often not significant in practice. We'll now take a look at the key losses in PPG, 
The orange box up top shows the losses used during the policy phase. These are the same losses used during PPO. The gradient of the surrogate objective, L clip, gives us an estimate of the policy gradient. I won't discuss the details here since this is covered in the PPO paper. As in PPO, we compute the value function targets using generalized advantage estimation. The value function loss is just the mean squared error between the current value function and the value function targets. The auxiliary phase, shown in blue, introduces a new loss, L joint. L joint has two key terms. The first is an arbitrary auxiliary objective to optimize, L aux. The second term can be viewed as a behavioral cloning objective. It's the KL divergence between the old and new policies. By optimizing the second term of the loss, we keep the new policy as close as possible to the old policy. In practice, there are many reasonable choices for what we might choose for L aux, but we made a simple choice here. We just use the value function as the auxiliary objective. This loss takes the same form as the value function loss from the policy phase, but now we're using an auxiliary value head from the policy network instead of the value head from the true value network. I'll now briefly cover the pseudocode for PPG. The pseudocode during the policy phase, shown in orange, closely resembles the pseudocode for PPO. As mentioned, we use the same policy and value function objectives. The only difference is that we store all data collected in a replay buffer. During the auxiliary phase, we perform a certain number of epochs of optimization over all of the replay buffer that we've collected. Here, we optimize two objectives, the joint loss we discussed on the previous slide, as well as the true value function loss. The more we optimize L joint, the more we're distilling features from the value function into the policy network. The more we optimize L value, the more we're training our value function to fit the current value targets. It's helpful to look at the key hyperparameters introduced by PPG. <laughs> NPI controls the number of policy updates performed in each policy phase. EPI and EV control the sample reuse for the policy and the value function, respectively. Both of these hyperparameters are used during the policy phase. Although these are conventionally set to the same value in PPO, this is not a strict requirement in PPG. Note that EV influences the training of the true value function and not the auxiliary value function. EOX controls the sample reuse during the auxiliary phase, representing the number of epochs performed across all data in the replay buffer. It's usually by increasing EOX rather than EV that we increase the sample reuse for value function training. Finally, beta clone controls the relative weight of the auxiliary term and the policy stabilization term during auxiliary optimization. Now we'll take a look at the performance of PBG compared to PPO on the environments in ProcGen benchmark. In blue, we show the score of agents trained with PPO, and in orange, we show the score of agents trained with PPG. This graph shows the mean and standard deviation across three separate runs. It's worth noting that the PPO baseline here is very well tuned. We performed extensive sweeps to choose all hyperparameters for this implementation of PPO. <laughs> Compared to PPO, PPG uses roughly double the sample reuse to train the value function. However, there are ultimately several critical differences between PPO and PPG, so it's not immediately clear that the extra value function sample reuse must be responsible for the performance improvement seen here. To understand the source of improvement, we'll dive into some more detailed ablations in the coming slides. The graph shown here unpacks the performance um, that we should, uh, in comparison between the two algorithms that we saw on the previous slide. The left-hand graphs show the performance of each agent on the 16 individual environments in ProcGen Benchmark. The right graph shows what we saw before, the mean normalized score across all these environments. Each environment contributes the same weight to this metric. What we can see here is that the performance improvement of PBG is really quite consistent across all these environments. In pretty much every environment, um, PBG is significantly outperforming PPO. And this level of consistency is uh, worth mentioning and not something that we always see when we're evaluating different RL algorithms. One of the most important hyperparameters in PPO is the level of sample reuse used throughout training. There are several ways this can be implemented, depending on if we're using a synchronous or an asynchronous pipeline. In the simplest synchronous case, we control the sample reuse 
by performing a certain number of epochs and all the data collected after a fixed amount of interaction in the environment. Every epoch is optimizing the same objective, but beyond the first epoch, we run the risk of overfitting to the data we've collected. We want to optimize as much as possible with each data point that we collect, but at some point we know that overfitting is going to lead to diminishing returns. The level of sample reuse controls this trade-off and is defined by the number of epochs of optimization we perform after every rollout. In general, we find that setting sample reuse equal to one is suboptimal since it leaves information on the table, so to speak. After only a single pass of optimization, we haven't yet milked each data point for all that it's worth. Empirically, we find that um, setting sample reuse to three in ProcGen is optimal or near optimal for PPO. If we set uh, sample reuse any higher to this, then performance starts to suffer. And these results can be seen in the graph on the right. PPO only has a single hyperparameter to control sample reuse, but as we previously mentioned, there's no reason to suspect that the policy and the value function will have the same optimal point for sample reuse. And PPG allows us to empirically choose this hyperparameter separately for both the policy and the value function. We'll next look at the effects of adjusting policy and value function sample reuse in isolation. We'll first look at what happens when we vary policy sample reuse in PPG. We do this by changing the number of policy epochs we perform on each rollout during the policy phase. Surprisingly, we find that PPG doesn't benefit at all from increasing the level of sam policy sample reuse. That is to say, it's best to use each data point exactly once to train the policy. This was a surprising result to us since we already knew that PPO prefers a higher level of sample reuse. Either the policy or the value function must be benefiting from the increased sample reuse in PPO. If the benefit isn't coming from the increased policy sample reuse, it must be coming from the increased value, value function sample reuse. This is what we'll look into next. This graph shows how varying the sample reuse of the value function impacts performance in PPG. <clears throat> we do this by varying the number of epochs performed during the auxiliary phase. We expect there to be a trade-off. Using too many epochs will run the risk of overfitting to recent data, while using too few epochs will lead to slower training. In the graph on the right, we're varying the performance of the, varying the number of auxiliary epochs from one to nine. We find that training with additional auxiliary epochs is generally beneficial, with performance tapering off somewhere um, around six to nine. There are two reasons that additional value function training might be helpful. The first, and perhaps the most obvious, is that training a more accurate value function will lead to a more accurate, i.e. lower variance, policy gradient. The second, less obvious reason is that the additional value function training can lead to better representation learning, and when these representations are shared with the policy, the policy is able to learn faster. In general, which benefit is more significant is likely to vary between environments. In proc environments, the feature sharing between policy and value networks appears to play the more critical role. By default, PPG comes with an increased memory footprint. Since we use disjoint policy and value function networks instead of a single unified network, we use approximately twice as many parameters compared to our PPO baseline. We can recover this cost and maintain most of the key benefits of PPG by using a single network that appropriately detaches the value function gradient. During the policy phase, we detach the value function gradient as the last layer shared between the policy and the value heads preventing the value function from influencing shared parameters. During the auxiliary phase, we take the value function gradient with respect to all parameters, including the shared parameters. This allows the policy to benefit from the representations learned by the value function while still removing the interference between um, the policy and the value function during the policy phase. As we can see, using PVG with a single shared network performs almost as well as PPO with a, um, as PPG with a dual network architecture. We were initially concerned that the value function might be unable to train well during the policy phase with the detached gradient, but in practice, this does not appear to be a major problem. We believe this is because the value function can still train from the full gradient during the auxiliary phase. In conclusion, there are two key benefits that PPG offers. The first is that PPG enables features to be shared between the policy and the value function while mitigating interference between these objectives. 
The second is that PPG enables us to independently vary the sample reuse of the policy and the value function. In practice, we find that this is beneficial because it allows us to safely increase the value function sample reuse and thereby benefit more from the value function as an auxiliary objective. The main drawbacks of PPG are relatively minor, but still worth mentioning. First, PPG introduces several new hyperparameters, and in general, those hyperparameters will have to be tuned. We use the same hyperparameter settings across all the diverse environments in Proxy and Benchmark, but it's possible that some of these hyperparameters would need to be retuned in a new domain. Second, by default, PPG comes with double the memory cost of PPO. However, as we just mentioned, to the extent that this is an issue, single network PPG can reduce the memory requirements back to baseline while maintaining most of the performance gains. We consider these drawbacks um, a fairly reasonable price to pay for PPG's significant improvement in sample efficiency. Thanks very much for listening. I'd like to extend a special thanks to my co-authors, John Shulman, Jacob Hilton, and Oleg Klimov. If you're interested, you can find the PPG code on the GitHub link shown in the slide. Hello again, everyone. Um, we will go ahead and now have a Q&A for um, the talk on basic policy gradient. You can go ahead and enter your questions um, directly into Rocket Chat, and then um, I'll, I'll be able to read them and answer them. Um, hopefully, we have some questions coming here pretty soon. If not, I can um, ask myself questions. <laughs> So um, while we wait for a question to come in, uh, I, th I think one natural question to ask is, you know, what other choices for an auxiliary objective might we use in BPG? So we chose to use the value function throughout this work, but um, you know, obviously there are a lot of other um, interesting auxiliary objectives that could be tried. And we did experiment with this a little bit. Um, initially, we had tried using things like, uh, you know, some some reconstruction loss. Um, you know, predicting frames a certain amount in the future. And we did initially see some benefit from this. Um, and, and that was what motivated our original work on basic policy gradients. But eventually, um, we, we just ended up swapping this with extra value function training. And that um, led to an even stronger boost in sample efficiency. And so that was what we really focused on for, um, yeah, for, for, for the core part of the PPG paper here. But um, we do think that's an interesting uh, area to explore further, mixing in other auxiliary losses. Um, one, of, one of the things that works well about PBG is just that we should be able to do like any arbitrary amount of auxiliary loss training here and keep you know the whole RL side stable. And so it's pretty nice to be able to decouple these um, two things. Whereas you know with regular RL training, we kind of have to just hope that you know we're not doing so much auxiliary training that um, it really that it interferes with the RL. Um, any any questions? I don't see anything. Let's see. Yeah, I don't don't see anything in Rocket Chat. Um, okay. Well, if there are no questions, um, oh, here we go. Yeah. Um, so Leonard has a question about. Uh, do, do you think the improvement of PBG over PPO is particularly important in procedurally generated environments, or also be the case on a "quote unquote" single end like Atari? Um, yeah, so I think I think whether or not PBG um, offers benefits is you know primarily dependent on you know the, the difficulty of learning features in the environment. So par partially in the case of our, our environments, this is just due to like the visual observation space. Obviously, Atari has this property as well. I think. Um, you know, it, it is definitely true that the fact that these environments are like so challenging that there's so much diversity contributes to the need to like learn more robust features. And, you know, I, I think Atari environments are just going to vary more. You know, some environments in Atari are going to be like really easy. Something like Pong might not, you know, require learning features very much. Um, it, you know, that's the, the state diversity is like fairly low versus other other um, uh, Atari environments like might so I, I I think it'll it'll vary, but in general, you know, we find that PBG has um, big boost in performance when there's um, when like separate networks won't train uh, very effectively, and then that's when there's a, yeah a, a need for sharing features. Um, okay, I think 
I'll, we'll briefly comment on how difficult it is to tune the hyperparameters in PBG. Um, yeah, that was that was really quite easy. I mean, and we we didn't retune any of them for like different environments. We just, you know, um, basically like the, the default values we worked like um, the default values we tried were quite good, and we didn't need to retune them for any of the other proctor environments. I think if we were in like a drastically different domain, then yeah, some of the more important hyperparameters might might need a slight retune. But in general, you know, th th there weren't any that were like super sensitive, provided that you kind of made a reasonable value or weren't trying to tune them to the extremes. Um, great. Well, thank you very much for the questions.